people think of these eureka moments and my feeling is that they tend to be little things. A little realisation and then a little realisation built on that. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts in England and Norway, Matthew Russell and Chris Carney. Do 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 do. Oh yeah, baby Penrose. Rose. <laughs> Rog. Oh, Rog. Roger Penrose. Fantastic. He's eighty-nine. Oof, that's a, that's quite a ripe old age. Eighty-nine and never been kissed. Born in Colchester, of course, he's English, and uh, went to the University of Cambridge and is now a professor at the University of Oxford. As good as it gets. Which is not, which is nice. Uh, before we start and say why we're mentioning Mr. Roger Penrose, it's uh, I want to do a big shout out and long overdue on this one. Shout out to the legends that are Justin the Sheriff Roberts and Justin the Tasmanian Devil Young. The two Justins that make this shizzle happen. The legends. Big them up. Of Patreon. Big them right up. They deserve their own Nobel Prize, if I'm honest. Justin Squared. The Nobel Prize of of podcast supporting. Yes. There should be one, shouldn't there? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Justins. Yeah, but I'm really chuffed. Roger Penrose has won the Nobel Prize. Yes, incredible. Incredible. The, uh, he's won half of it. He's won half yes. of it, sharing it with Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Getz. Professor Getz, she becomes the fourth woman ever to win the physics prize. 200 have been handed out, only four to women, which is, let's face it, that there has to be something slightly wrong there, particularly in physics where there is a lot of good Women in physics. It's just ridiculous, in fact. Yeah, the, the balance to needs to be addressed, much like much like in physics. So there definitely isn't an equal force pushing in two directions there. Absolutely. Um, it is obviously for uh, black holes, yes. this is. So this is what the Nobel Prize said. They said, He understood the mathematics, he introduced new tools, and then could actually prove this is a process you can naturally expect to happen, that a star collapses and turns into a black hole. Do you know what? Since they've actually started doing the Nobel Prize from Mumbai, I think it's just all the better. In fact, yeah, what country is the uh, it's the Nobel Prize? I believe it's Norway. Is it Norway? Yeah, it's Norway. It's done at Oslo. It's from here where I am right now. Is that right? Not in this house, but, you know, in on, yeah, it's it's a Norwegian thing it's sw- isn't it swedish nobel was swedish the nobel peace prize is in norway in fact i've been i've been to the nobel museum nobel was swedish but the peace prize is in norway correct but where where does the physics prize get handed out sweden. the physics prize gets handed out in sweden ah uh, there we go but they're pretty so much the same it didn't you know <laughs> I don't reckon you're going to have a happy time now. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Obviously, um, uh, Roger Penrose, great friend of Stephen Hawking, of course. Yeah. He worked out really the sort of, not only could you get to black holes via Einstein's theory of general relativity, but it, and sh- and showed the process of how it could happen. I think that that's the, the, the interesting of the standing on shoulders of giants thing is that Einstein... Put the laid down an incredible foundation, but he actually didn't believe that black holes could exist, even though he'd laid the foundations for them to be discovered. Well, Einstein died before the word black hole was ever coined, hmm. so he'd never Einstein never heard of a black hole in his life. No, isn't that incredible? It's kind of sad. If you're wondering who Reinhard Genzel. And Andrea Getz are. I was. So Roger Penrose is the, and this normally happens, I guess, in physics. Roger Penrose did the maths and showed how it could happen. And then the experimenters, the Genzel and Getz, they used large telescopes and have been looking at the orbits of the stars going round Sagittarius A star, which, of course, essentially is 
all the proof you need that there is a massive black hole at the centre of our galaxy because they've been watching them in these crazy orbits around some very, very, very dense but dark object. The speed that these stars can accelerate to around the black hole are phenomenal, aren't they? Yeah, they, they start to become relativistic. So they go ridiculously fast, yeah. They're the fastest known stars, the ones that are, that are orbiting Sagittarius A star. They're just insane. Yeah. And remember, the supermassive black hole, even though it's millions of times heavier than the sun, it's only a few times bigger and would fit well inside the orbit of Mercury. What? I didn't know that bit. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's crazy, isn't it? And that's, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, oh. Wow. <laughs> so I, I'm actually going so, – so today's episode is going to be about – well, uh, the second half of it is going to be about uh, one stage further back from the craziness of black holes. We're going to be talking about neutron stars to oh, yes. Katia Moskvich, who has been the editor of Wired UK. She works for Nature, BBC. But more importantly, in 2019, she was European Science Journalist of the Year. Whoa. This is what another Nobel Prize winner of physics, Joseph H. Taylor, said about the book – Neutron stars, super dense balls of nuclear matter at the end points of stellar evolution, are detectable from Earth through their emission of radio and gravitational waves. Katia Moskvich provides a fascinating tour of the world's most sensitive detectors for such radiation. The prediction and discovery of neutron stars, their place in the grand cosmic scheme, and up-close views of many of the gifted astrophysicists behind these discoveries. <laughs> Excellently done. Nobel Prize winning physicist. It doesn't get much better than that. No, well, he got the Nobel Prize because he found the first binary neutron stars. And essentially that allowed him to see gravitational waves. Mm. That was a big Nobel Prize win. What's better than a neutron star? Binary neutron stars. These neutron stars had also been super sped up by the fact that they'd been eating other stars. Greedy little so-and-sos. An ice skater getting faster and faster. Yeah. Crazy. They're crazy objects, but not quite as crazy as black holes that are so crazy that it's just just blows your mind. Yeah, I like the bit that, the, you know, whenever I'm, I'm reading or watching something about a neutron stars, I always like to see a little bit about a teaspoon of a neutron star would be heavier than the air. <laughs> Weighs more than Mount Everest, yes, or something like that, yes. Yeah, I love that yes. type of stuff. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Space News of the Week, the James Webb Telescope. Oh, what a gorgeous telescope. Yeah, it is getting closer to launch. So it's just being blasted with 140 decibels of sound. That's a real ear popper. It's very loud, that is. That yeah. is almost 100 times louder than a gig at 100 decibels. Oh, that's like when I went to see My Bloody Valentine. Probably like when I went to see Judas Priest as a kid on the Ram It Down tour when they came back to Birmingham and played and played a tiny club called Zanzibar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so loud that I actually started panicking every time Rob Halford sang very, very loudly. <laughs> but, yeah, they, they, it, instead of sounding like hell-bent for leather, the, it, they, they played essentially the, um, the, the Ariane 5 sound, like the sound of Ariane 5, the, yeah. the spectrum of sound, specially engineered so that it would um, rattle the uh, space telescope and they had 600 sensors all over making sure that the telescope wasn't falling apart this is incredible because the parts of the james webb are just so intricate and so delicate so for them to be able to withstand yeah. this yeah. kind of sound is just an engineering marvel as far as i'm concerned it's absolutely amazing yeah, absolutely aw awesome this sandra irish who works at nasa's Goddard Space Flight Centre in Greenbelt, Maryland, with good old Tupper, I should imagine. He's a friend of, of uh, Sandra's. Uh, mm. She said, through the team's dedication, hard work, and just pure excitement in being a part of this complex test, it was a complete success, and I have known these individuals for many years, and it's been an honour to work with each one of them. I love Dering Gone with the Wind. Frankly, Chris, 
I don't give a damn. <laughs> oh, nice. So the James <laughs> Webb, that's it. It's, it's got a few more tests left. It's got a few more tests left when, yeah. they're, when they're going to unfurl the mirror and the sun, sun shield. But once that's done, yeah, it gets shipped off to the European spaceport in South America. Just to prepare it for oh, launch. And we're that? talking about a year from now, is that right? Yeah, o- October 21. Yeah, a year away. That's so exciting. We should really talk about uh, our, our mate Elon Musk. Drink. 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 I make it 762 Starlinks are currently in orbit. What? That's pretty massive. I yeah. know. Considering yeah. there's only about two and a half before there was only about two and a half thousand working satellites. That is becoming a large percentage of the satellite working satellite population. Yeah. Which is quite, quite amazing, isn't it? So yes, Falcon 9, uh, October the 6th, 60 more Starlinks to uh, join the 715 already launched. But over the last couple of months, about 47 of the original 60 now have been deorbited. Now, the mm. way that Jonathan McDowell uh, um, describes this, he says, eventually the satellite is low enough and the ambient density is high enough that the vehicle heats, breaks up, and is destroyed. These Starlink retirements should perhaps be termed propulsion-assisted orbital decay. Yeah, because they're not quite deorbited. They're sort of pushed down and then allowed to just burn up in the atmosphere. And so it's a little bit uncontrolled but controlled enough so it's not dangerous to anyone. And definitely better the, than so being, the, like, you know, remaining in space as junk. Yeah, definitely, yeah, de- obviously better than debris. But what's what's funny is that they, SpaceX haven't really said why they're deorbiting these satellites, um, and there's been another company, Viasat, who've been basically saying, oh, it's because these satellites are really unreliable and they're having to sort of... Uh, bring them out of orbit, which SpaceX deny, and and it actually annoyed McDowell as well because they were using his data and he couldn't see the justification. So it started a little spat between all three of them. Really, mm. I think McDowell's a bit more grown up than that, but he, but yes, I don't think he was particularly happy that his data was being kind of misrepresented. Um, I love Jonathan McDowell, by the way. He's just the most awesome of the space people out there on Twitter. Yeah. Um, um, yes, so it, the, the rocket first stage was on its third mission, landed on the drone ship, of course, I still love you, and one of the two payload fairings was caught by the old big catching glove ship. Oh, and, 50%. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the second stage was deorbited, and I should imagine proper deorbiting, southwest of Australia. So somewhere there's a second stage of a of a falcon nine sitting in the ocean somewhere down at the bottom they don't mm. uh, i like that fact uh, from a couple of podcasts ago when we learned that you know obviously they have to sink they're not allowed to have any kind of floating and it just you know it sounds so <laughs> sounds so obvious but you're like yeah that makes a lot of sense but i mean how many <laughs> how many how many of these must be at the bottom of the oceans now uh, oh there's loads there's absolutely tons of that stuff at the bottom of the ocean Somebody must know the actual figure, it, really. but it, it must be thousands, <sighs> at least hundreds. Yeah, somebody probably does know that. Yeah. I mean, you work it out by how many orbital launches there's been, but I guess there might be a load of ICMBs and stuff like that as well. Yeah. That you yeah. don't know about. They're just launched, yeah. So, yeah. Oosh. Um Talking of ICMBs and yeah. the and and the and the Russians <laughs> <laughs> and Elon Musk drink drink. Uh, yes, the Ru- uh, the Russians did reveal a sort of clone of the Falcon Nine called the Amor, the Aim Amor, mm. Amor, Amor, and I think it's Amor is to Falcon as Buran was to Shuttle, mm. really. Um. And obviously, it's been over 60 years they've been using the R7-based Soyuz. Um, and so it is about time they retired it. So um, Musk has already years. pointed out, though. Yeah. I know, it's absolutely incredible, isn't it? $880 million it's going to cost to get this going. And they want to fly it, I think, in 2026. But Musk has basically pointed out that they're going to have to do better than that because even... 
the Falcon 9 will be outdated because Starship will be up and running and therefore it'll just be a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> which is, which is quite funny. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, but I mean, the, the, I don't think the Russians are going to build it anyway. They, 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 they are quite literally full of hot air really at the moment. The, well, the, I wish the, them the all the luck space. in the world. And, and you know what? I if mean, I do, did, I do. But, if it does uh, any better, if it's any better than their Concorde, then they're, they're definitely <laughs> a little bit ahead, aren't they? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no, definitely. And as Franco Australians say, that's a mur, eh? Oh, <laughs> oh, Matthew. I think that might be my worst joke ever. Um, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> there was a there was a green. There was the part six of eight of the green run for SLS, basically. The green run this time was just a simulated countdown. Hmm. Seven and eight is going to be filling them up, filling up the great big uh, tanks. And then the final test is actually firing up the best ever rocket engines ever made, the RS-25s. Beautiful. Lee Solid's favourite engine. And what's going to happen with SLS? It's going to just dump them in the sea, despite the fact that they're designed to be reusable. See what? Which is pretty depressing. Why? Why? Talking of massively late and overcost space things and a bit of shocks, mm. uh, old Chris Ferguson. My namesake. Uh, yes, Chris Ferguson, your namesake. Apart from the fact he's got a different surname, Chris, you may have noticed. It's, it's slightly different. But, yeah, it's slightly <laughs> bit different. Chris, yes, Chris Ferguson has stepped down from being the uh, on the first crewed flight of the Boeing CST-100 Starliner. Because hmm. of the best kind of family issues, he put it. So, you know, maybe his daughter's having a baby or something like that. You know, something cool is happening in his life and he doesn't want to miss it. So he stepped down and let his old mate, Barry Butch Wilmore, take over. Oh, Barry. They're both pretty seasoned astronauts. Ferguson's yeah. done three shuttle flights. Barry Butch Wilmore's done a, a shuttle and a Soyuz, four EVAs, and he was the Capcom for the final shuttle as well. Oh, How about that? Cracking fella, Butch. So Ferguson hasn't ruled out future missions after that. There's a, there's a very weird story about uh, Butch Wilmore. There was a rumour going round that he saw... He saw Ramirez outside of the space station knocking on the door, even though Ramirez was inside with him. He was like, can you imagine how terrified I was? And like it, it, it did the rounds of, oh, my God, this is terrifying, that he could see him outside and he was knocking on the door and I said, who is it? It's Ramirez, but Ramirez was inside the shuttle with them. And it turned out to be a website that was a bit like The Onion, which made up stories ab about what famous people say. And oh. literally has it at the bottom. This, these aren't true, by the way, because oh, Ramirez no. doesn't even exist. He doesn't even exist as an astronaut. But oh. uh, people keep occasionally tweeting this story like it actually happened. Oh God! Oh no! I mean, this doesn't help anyone. I do love a good parody site, but it doesn't do. It doesn't help anything in the, in the, in the battle against <laughs> fake news, does it? <laughs> now this this is definitely super cool, and I'm quite surprised this hasn't come up in the news more. But uh, Issa Jax's Bepi Colombo, which I saw when I was in, when not when I was actually at um, the CSG in South America, I saw yeah. it being um, uh, fueled and stitched up uh, with Eric, and we and uh, just before its launch, and it's now it's been doing a sort of big circles in the of the inner solar system. It's now coming back to do a flyby of Venus to get a gravity assist to help it get into Mercury's orbit. So it's yeah. doing these series of gravity assists. And the next one is on the 15th of October going around Venus. And Whoa. I was sitting there going, oh, how exciting is this? Because this is on the 15th of October and – they're going to have some operational um, equipment aboard. You know, so they're actually going to test out some of the payloads on, on Bepi Colombo. So I uh, asked the head of the Venus Flyby Task Force, Valeria Mangano, about whether they were going to use it to look at phosphine 
And she instantly came back to me and said, the answer to your question is yes. Yes. Amazing. So Beppe <laughs> Colombo, yes, Beppe Colombo will attempt phosphine detection while making its flyby. Because there's two instruments, Phoebus and Mertis. And Mertis has these two channels set at 7 to 14 and 7 to 40 microns, which are the IR lines of phosphine. It's sensitive enough to, to, to pick up that particular chemical signature, but it's all down to whether the phosphine is a is high, in high enough concentration to be detected by Mertis. If Mertis actually does detect it, that is absolutely monumentally fluky it's incredible it's like a ridiculous like <laughs> it's unbelievable i mean like a <laughs> month after the story breaks yeah you've got you just so happen to have a european spacecraft a european japanese spacecraft passing by and the extra double whammy of that of course is that um not only is this uh, a, a sort of uh, euro jaxa spacecraft but of course jaxa have also got the akatsuki venus climate orbiter there as well which means that they'll be able to do a a planned coordinated observation between ground observation bepi colombo and akatsuki but yeah i think the key is in the name colombo because you know colombo incredibly intuitive doing some detective work i reckon like just as you know, it's done one one of the final um, orbits of, of Venus. It'll go, right, come in, Colombo, and it'll go, wait a minute, just one more, just one more orbit before I go. <laughs> and and it's and as it goes round, it'll be slightly wonky eyed as well, because what one of the instruments <laughs> won't be won't be used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you know, because it, it it's not not suitable. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm really chuffed by that. And I have to say, I'm, I'm very grateful for Valeria to get, getting back from so absolutely le- letting me yeah. know. And she was very, she was actually very excited. So I think we all should be pretty excited about the whole, the whole goddamn thing. Yeah, absolutely. What are the chances? It just so happened to have <laughs> a really good uh, piece of equipment with, um, with atmospheric detectors. Yeah, on board definitely. just so, yeah. just so happened to be doing a flyby of venus well i mean what the heck and it's going to do a much closer one than the next time it comes around as well so if it doesn't do it this time round, there's still a chance next year that it's going to do it uh when it comes back round to do its closer uh swing by a venus to go out eventually out to uh, mercury it's like a particularly good episode of this is your life you know, it's like, ding, oh, ding. Gee, well, it just so happens we've got it here today. Uh, <laughs> and he's going to, Bepi Colombo's here today, and he's going to detect that phosphine you've always been talking about. Uh, Michael Aspel with the book. And uh, yeah. <laughs> My favorite paper of the week was sent in by the good old um, Spodcats. Yeah. They, um, they sent this one in, and it was In Search for a Planet. Better than Earth. Mm. <laughs> Top contenders for a super habitable world. And Yummy. by Dirk Schultz, Makuch, Rene Heller, and Edward Guinan. Now, this, I mean, that's some title, isn't it? In Search of a Better Planet Than Earth. It's not, it's not hard. It's not hard at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll name one Mars. Pluto. Not even a planet. Pluto. <laughs> So yeah, we've we've actually talked about the rare Earth hypothesis. I'm I'm a big fan of it, and mm. um, yeah, this was Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee from the University of Washington argued that the origin of intelligent life required improbable combinations of astrophysical and geological events and circumstances, um, and I and I kind of agree. And so yeah. this book in, came out in only in the year two thousand. Rare Earth why complex life is uncommon in the universe. And it's 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 kind of di- in a direct contrast to Drake and Sagan. Rocky planets, like the Earth, <laughs> would be common. <laughs> is that good. better? <laughs> As, uh, essentially, the principle of mediocrity. 
or mm. it's which is which is a variation of the Copernican principle. Copernican basically said we we shouldn't be having a privileged position in the universe that they're that essentially we're just average, mm. and mediocrity is the mediocrity principle is is a similar sort of thing. Is you know if you've got a set of data, you should assume that if it's the only one you have, that it comes from the most common set of data. Yeah. That's the best assumption to make. Uh, I mean, it's obviously not always true, um, but but it's a good heuristic. So, um, yes, so the heuristic of the rare earth is basically, let's have a look at all the crazy things that you need to have a planet that works yeah. for, for complex life. Yeah. First of all, the biggest scale, the type of galaxy you're in, right? The type of galaxy you're in, it has to be a, the type of galaxy where the central black hole, in our case, the Sagittarius A star, has to be of the right level of activity. If it's too active, obviously it's a disaster. Yeah, Everything just gets irradiated and 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 destroyed. And if it's and if it's not radio, if it's not active enough then there's not enough star formation and all these other things that that they seem to think it actually that the the activity of the black hole is massively important for the for the evolution of the galaxy itself so that's pretty important and then you've yep. got the kind of goldilocks zone within that galaxy if you if you're too <clears throat> close to the center the metallicity is too high too far out it's too low then you've got all this high energy activity and if there's if if you're in a region that that's too dense with stars, the stars can can perturb all your planets and stuff like that. So that's really important. You've got to be in a good position. Then you've got to then you've got to be in a good orbit as well. It's good. You've got to be probably in a circular orbit so that you, you, the path of your orbit around the galaxy center doesn't send you streaming through lots of other stars. And and you've got to have something that's really stable that's not changing all the time. Uh, so that in itself seems pretty. That's, that's enough for me. Right? That's enough for me. To, yeah, I, I, yeah, but then we haven't even st- we haven't even started because <laughs> you need the right type. <laughs> you need the right type of star, and probably not a binary. And most stars are born as binaries. I don't know. I've seen Star Wars. Um, I'm not I'm saying, saying it's saying, impossible. Just saying, but I don't think it helps. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it can't be too violent a star. So none of your massive stars because they burn off too quickly. And it's got to be have the right chemical makeup. So it's got to be have a, a star that was born in a nebula that had the materials necessary for life. So early stars wouldn't have had that. You need like material from supernovas and stuff like that in in the mix to be able to have the right ingredients for life. Yeah, you've got to be the right distance from your star. So obviously, liquid water being the obvious reason for that, you've got to have the right arrangement of planets. So you can't have like your gas giants nearby and like <laughs> and creating all sorts of havoc. And also, the way it seems to have happened is the gas giants came in, mopped up our bit of space, and then and then went back out again. But I saw something uh, which said suggested that the you know the sort of a hot Jupiter's sort of thing is that our solar system essentially did have the same sort of like system with a hot Jupiter close to the sun, but for some reason it's it moved out into the into the outer rings of the solar system, mm. and that's one of the reasons a- why we're able to, we've been able to develop complex life. If it had been like most other solar systems, it just wouldn't have happened. Yeah, well, exactly. So, that, so this is this arrangement of planets. I think that's called the Paris model or something like that, yeah. or the no, the Nice, the Nice model. I think it is. Um, right. Uh, but yes, it, it's the um, yeah. I mean, so that's that looks incredibly rare because when you look at the exoplanets we found so far, they don't really look like the right arrangement of planets. You've got to have the right sized planet. If it's too small, it will cool down too quickly, like Mars. If it's too big, it might hold too thick an atmosphere like Venus. You want it to have plate tectonics. You want it to have a magnetic field. You want it to have a large moon to create an axial tilt 
and 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 you want it to to, to you know help with the rotational speed in and the, and stabilize that tilt and give you tides and ha- help with plate tectonics so a large moon is actually unbelievably important so important <laughs> and, then, and also in terms of, yeah. <laughs> of life development outside of the ocean as well like uh, of life leaving the ocean has a lot to do with the moon as well which is again just incredible because yeah. we could have complex I, life in, in oceans, but <laughs> intelligent life in oceans is so much more difficult. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and in, and and yeah. I mean, the moon just does so many things, and the axial tilt is just—it's incredible because the axial tilt was caused by the formation of the moon, probably, as was the atmosphere. Like it, we might have had too thick an atmosphere without that impact event, yeah. but the axial tilt gives us seasons and and all the yeah. kind of benefit that that brings. But the, but the big one for me is this jump from the po- prokaryotes to the eukaryotes, you know, simple life forms into complex life forms, seems to have only happened once in the four billion years that the prokaryotes ruled the world. Yeah. And then once that happened, the Cambrian explosion, it's like, it, you know, we didn't look back, the, 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 you know, evolution didn't look back, but it seems like that must have been just an incredibly rare event where like an early mitochondria just so happened to sort of wander into another cell and create a multicellular life just seems (laughs) insanely unlikely. We we evolved eyes and we didn't look back. (laughs) I mean, that might, I mean, that really might be the great filter right there, that, that, that jump there. And then you've got sexual reproduce, reproduction yep. sexual reproduction which which is a massive mystery how that ever sort of came about and why it's so common in in life but it's certainly a massive driver of speciation and evolution and the fact that evolution has happened at the right time in history as well with all these different um extinction events and stuff like that but the the, the right time of evolution happened after lots of animals have given their life for oil fields and stuff like that and there's the right number of extinction events. And then the crazy improbable jump to humans that are just totally overpowered with, with ridiculous abilities that would be normally weeded out by natural selection because they take too much energy resource to do, like big brains and ridiculous hand-to-eye coordination and all that kind of stuff. It's just So that's we haven't even got onto the paper, although it, the paper runs on similar lines to this. So, yeah. I mean, you only have to sort of read that out, and you, you, and and you, it's pretty compelling, isn't it? The the rare earth argument. It is. Then, when you consider through the Drake equation, the scale that we're thinking about here, those probabilities are reduced by a huge amount. And I'm not challenging yeah. a very well, you know, but very well written uh, scientific paper, which is far more research than. I will ever do in my life, but against the the sheer numbers, it then the rare earth thing becomes it. It does shake a little bit in those terms. Oh no, no, you, you're absolutely right. It's the sheer numbers that make it that make it probable that there there may be another there may be intelligent life elsewhere in the in the galaxy. Yeah. But it but, does you know, throw a little bit. It does throw a little bit of a, it's a, a little bit of in the, the face works, of Drake, yeah, <laughs> of him going. Well, it's simple. There's this many planets. There's this many stars. But, but, you know. he, but, here's, <laughs> but, here, but here's the weird thing. So this argues from a very similar point of view as 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 um, as Drake, the Drake equation, mm. uh, and 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 Sagan. Uh, this super habitability um, paper is saying, well, why don't we look for planets that are better than Earth? They're saying because neglecting the possible possibility of having super habitable planets could be considered anthropocentric or geocentric and mm. runs opposite in the opposite direction to the principle of mediocrity or, or, or uh, Copernicus's principle, i.e. the Earth isn't a special place. So there there should be even better planets than earth you know this is like the this is kind of like the mediumly good planet for life <laughs> so th- this paper suggests and actually there's some kind of truth to that you know what's the chances of living on the best planet for life 
it's it's very anthropocentric, as you're saying. It's basically where we we can only see it from our perspective, and we we you have to, to you, and it also disregards the what we've been talking about for the last few weeks about how life could be completely different from what we know it to be. You know, uh, it's it, it yeah, could be I, completely made up of a different type of process than we than 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 we even know of. So yeah, the the, the super habitability thing is. Is really, you know, I've gone both ways in this uh, this whole thing already. <laughs> I know. Well, sides. same here. I mean, <laughs> it just makes you know, it makes you realise how little we actually know. And and yeah, this paper doesn't deal in these alternative niches of alternative life. You know, the stuff that where like say ammonia is the solvent instead of water and things like that. So this paper doesn't really look at that. It kind of it relies on the kind of normal thing that the rare earth does. That that it's like well the life that we know about is the only life so let's just let's just work with that and mm. it looks at earth and the thing about earth is that the um life on earth dominates the geosphere so unlike mars or venus we know that it doesn't we know that for certain that that if there is life on mars or venus it's not dominating the planet unlike earth mm. where that we where the entire atmosphere has been completely changed by life and we're dominating that kind of atmosphere, you know, we, we, there is absolutely no, <laughs> there's no ambiguity that there's life on earth, right? You can, you can no. see it very, very clearly. Um, and it, it comes down. So in terms of super habitability, do you mean biomass or biodiversity? So they're sort of going for both. They're sort of saying that you, that you need a massive biomass. So lots and lots and lots and lots of life and lots of it. And that creates biodiversity as well. And and you can kind of look at that in terms of the way that Earth has Earth has changed over the different millennia. Um, but an example of something that's unlikely to have a richer uh, a richer kind of biodiversity is something like Europa. You know, it, it's yeah. not it, it's it. it it's unlikely to have either a bigger biomass or biodiversity than a planet that allows life on its surface. So these under, you know, these underwater, under the surface oceans and stuff are unlikely to be super habitable. They might be habitable, but they're unlikely to be super habitable. So, so what we have um, here is like a, a sort of spectrum of, 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 of life, a spectrum of, of, of uh, habitability. Hmm. Exactly. And so exactly. if we've got the lower spectrum, we're in the middle, then there must be super habitability. Yeah. Well, there, and there is a, a planetary habitability index or the PHI. So this was actually invented by Schultz McCook et al. in 2011, the writers of this paper. And right. uh, the PHI for early Earth at the time life originated was set to one. Just arbitrarily. Right. So one, so Earth has a level one and obviously super habitable has a value greater than one. So get this, the PHI of Earth today is only 0.96. Oh, it's gone down. It's gone down because the moon has moved slightly further away. So there's a reduction in tidal forces. And, and those tidal forces were actually helping, slightly assisting the uh, likelihoods of life. Wait, hang on. So, that's gone down in eight years. That's gone down to 0.96. You no, know, not, in <laughs> no. <laughs> not in eight years. No, not in eight years. When life right. when life first originated on the planet. Oh, like sorry. I was billion, basing on when like the paper four was billion written. Years sorry. Ago. No, not when the paper. God, no, that would be terrifying if that was the case. <laughs> How fast are we moving? <laughs> it's like, hang on a second. Well, what, we're losing 4% every eight years? Well, <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, it, it's, would, at the current rate, it's not going to surprise us, is it, really? No, actually oh, no. Oh, God. No. Yeah, we've made too many depressing, <laughs> depressing calls. Mm. So, yes, th there's a table in the paper of most valuable planets, or MVPs as they call it. Oh. And and these are the things that they think it must have. It must orbit around a K dwarf star. It must be at about five to eight billion years old. Anything up to one point five times more massive than the Earth, and about ten percent larger than the Earth. So 
nothing bigger than that. Mean surface temperature of about 5 degrees C and higher than the Earth. Moist atmosphere, 25 to 30% O2 levels and the rest inert gases. Scattered land water distributed with lots of shallow water areas and archipelagos. A large moon, up to 10% of the planetary mass, at a moderate distance, and has plate tectonics and, uh, uh, and similar geological recycling mechanisms. Strong protective geomagnetic field. So pretty, pretty similar to the list of the rare earth things, really. Yeah. Um, and they applied that list to the 4,000 exoplanets found. But unfortunately, obviously, that, that list that they've given the data is the data sets are very incomplete it doesn't show all those things for example any planet that's found with the transit method doesn't show you the mass it only shows you the radius of the planet i.e its size but not its mass um yeah and the doppler effect does it the, the the other way around it will show you what the mass is as it's pulling the star around but it won't show you what its radius is so you you don't you don't know its density so that so a lot of the data is missing um, but if you take planets up to two Earth radii, and, and which is compensating for the error in the data, and and in reality you probably don't want anything bigger than 1.1 Earth radii, uh, you end up with 24 planets in the MVP set, nine orbiting K stars, and 16 about the right age, and five in the right temperature range, but only KOI 5715.01 fits all the data so far and only if it has a strong greenhouse effect it could be super habitable Ooh. but yeah. oh, i think i but think they need to all, give it a catchier name if it's going to be though what super habitable no super yeah like they'll super. call it if they call the planet oh, super I habitable, think, they'll I, just be oh, koi 571501 it's just not that yeah. it's not that catchy is it no it's a little bit shy. Someone it's needs to do coy. better PR. Someone needs to do better PR for this planet. They should call it Carp, and it would be good. The Koi Carp, then, wouldn't it? Yes, that's better. Yeah, so it's, it's a start. <laughs> yeah, it's a start. I think. Uh, I think uh, um, listeners to the Interplanetary Podcast should um, write in and let us know the name for this particular super habitable planet. Yes, and we will but, yeah, send so that uh, information out, and they will rename the planet. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I think the long and short of all this is that uh, basically they've come up with a novel way of sorting the planets that we discover and put them in a list that kind of means that we're, where we should be concentrating our efforts. Mm. And we may have found a new Eden, better than Earth. Um, yeah. uh, and But nothing within 100 light years yet. Uh, but if we do find one of these SHs, or an MVP in uh, that's nearer than a hundred light years away, then clearly that would that should be given massive priority for follow up observations with things like the James Webb Telescope. Yes, yes, it all loops back. So I think we're going to go straight to uh, Katia Moskvich's um, interview. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. I go I... the interplanetary. Podcast, putting the ace back into space. So I'm joined on the podcast by uh, Katia Moskvich, who's written an enormous book about neutron stars, which I'm making my way through, and it's extremely interesting. Welcome to the show, Katia. Thank you. Whereabouts are you at the moment? I'm actually in Zurich, uh, which is lovely. Lovely Switzerland, amazing weather, really nice, enjoying Indian summer today. You're originally an English journalist, aren't you? Is that right? Well, I was born in Russia. I grew up in Montreal, um, moved to Montreal when I was a kid. And uh, then I worked as a science journalist in London, yeah. Um, for the last 12 years or so. Wow, so very, very international. Absolutely, exactly, yes. Science knows no borders, I think, so it doesn't really matter where you are as long as science is interesting. That's one of the best bits about the book is your journeys to all these incredible observatories all around the world. So what was that like? I mean, I, I, I must admit, I am extremely jealous when, when people for their job manage to go to these places. Yeah, so actually... 
it's yeah, it was amazing. It was the the best uh, bit of the book for me. Um, the way it happened, uh, I got approached by um, uh, one of the editors at uh, Quanta magazine back um, uh, a long time ago to write a story on neutron stars. It was in 2017, I think. And uh, shortly after that, um, I get this LinkedIn message uh, from a guy I don't know, and he claims to be from Harvard University Press, and he claims that he have he has read um, the story of mine that I wrote on neutron stars, and he was super excited, and he said, "Look, you know what? Um, I loved your coverage of astronomy and neutron stars, and like astronomy in general." Do you want to write a book about it for us? And I was like, okay, that must be spam. I, you know, I normally don't get messages like that through LinkedIn. What is this? This is ridiculous. So at first I didn't even reply, uh, but then uh, I, I got curious. I Googled him. His name is Jeff Dean. He's an amazing guy. And I said, are you serious? And he's like, yeah, I'm serious. You know, I love your writing. Why don't you just write a book about anything? And I said, well, you read that story on neutron stars. Neutron stars, are it's something that's completely, you know, underreported, but also fascinating. So why don't we do that? And that's how it happened. And uh, once they approved the, the proposal for the book, um, I started thinking, I thought, okay, if I were to write something like that, then uh, the best way of doing it would be to actually go to these places. Because it's, you know, it's so far away. We don't really like we can't go to a neutron star right uh so the best we could do uh, is to talk to people who actually are making all these discoveries and to talk to them in person to see how they are to get their facial expressions to see how excited they get when they talk about their work and to go to these places where the discoveries are being made um and for me that was the highlight of the book and i remember everybody was saying at the time like why would you do that that's ridiculous like you can just pick up the phone and talk to them on the phone it's the same thing and i said no it's not the same thing and it was actually self financed most, uh, most for the most part because you know a uh, publisher wouldn't pay for travels obviously uh authors would just get back uh, whatever you know from a percentage of the sales so but at the time, I was also I started working for Wired, and uh, a few stories that I did for the book, uh, I also uh, wrote different articles, uh, shorter versions or whatever, for Wired, and that's how. And my editor, editor in chief of Wired UK, was aware of that, so you know that kind of helped to finance some of the uh, travels. And, you know, a couple of travels I combined with presentations at conferences that I was invited to. Uh, and that at the same time, like, for example, in Australia, I uh, participated in a panel discussion of a technology conference and they paid the flight. So that was amazing because, you know, I didn't have to pay the flight myself, which, yeah, it's just probably a bit expensive for uh, to write a book. Right. And uh, but then at the same time, once I was in Australia, I managed to visit an amazing telescope, the Parkes telescope. Um, so... So it just all it was all about the travels and the people who who work there at these places. These observatories that observe neutron stars and pulsars, are they all similar or or are they very different in design or, or what's the sort of general design of these things? They're all very different actually. Uh so, you know, neutron stars are objects we can't see in optical light normally. Uh, because basically they are just the remains of uh, a regular star. So if you take a star like our sun, once it dies, it's just going to like slowly, you know, fade away and become a brown dwarf, really boring object <laughs> we can't really detect. It just stays there forever, like whatever. Uh, but if you take a star that is about 8 to 20 times bigger than the sun, when it's going to die, it's going it, to, it's not going to just die. It's going to go out with a, with a, bang, right? It's going to die in a supernova explosion, which we can detect. What we uh, didn't know in the past for many, many years, like we, we could see the supernova, but we didn't know what would stay behind. And, uh, you know, a uh, long time ago, like ancient astronomers, Chinese astronomers and Egyptian astronomers, they saw guest stars that would suddenly appear in the sky. Those were supernovae that suddenly would kind of a, a star would appear where it wasn't before, where it wasn't it wasn't a new star. It was just star dying in a supernova explosion, and us suddenly seeing this brightness for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months, and then it would disappear. So they called it guest stars. And only you know many 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 um, years later, 
we found out that actually what stays behind is the score uh, of a regular star, which is a neutron star. And it's it's tiny. It's only 20, about 20 kilometers in diameter. It spins very fast, about, you know, you know, up to maybe 600 revolutions a second or something like that. And it doesn't give off any light. So first, you know, scientists kind of thought that these objects might exist, but they thought, okay, if they do exist, we'll never ever detect them because we can't see them. And then they thought, okay, well, um, what if what if these objects could be detected in, like, say, radio? What if they give off, give, give off radio waves? And that's exactly what happened. Um, in 1967, uh, Joyce Lynn Bell in the UK, she completely by accident detected a pulse, which was a really weird pulse. She wasn't looking for pulses because, you know, we didn't know that they existed uh, for real. Um, and suddenly she saw, uh, yeah, she saw something which uh, they even called it uh, Little Green Men because they thought, okay, maybe it might be aliens or something. And it wasn't. It was it was the first pulsar ever detected in 1967. Uh, her PhD supervisor went on to receive a Nobel Prize for that. Actually, she she never did, which I think is a is quite it's sad. It's a bit rough. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, just to answer your question, so the first, the very first uh, telescope that you know that she detected the first pulsar was. It wasn't even a telescope in probably your or my understanding, like I never knew, never thought that uh, a telescope could be just a collection of wooden poles because that's what it was. It was literally, and I went there, I went to Cambridge and I saw this array. Uh, right now there's not much left because all these poles, uh, you know, uh, they were, they used to have um, copper wire that, you know, kind of was, um, uh, that covered the poles. Uh, copper wire was stolen a long, long time ago. People probably just stole it and sold it for money or whatever. Um, <laughs> and, but yeah, that's what they that's what they used uh, at the time to detect uh, radio waves. Um, and then, of course, there were other telescopes that that we do have now as well, like you know the really big um, antenna, like a radio antenna. And the bigger, the better. So in China, they designed fast this. A human, like really huge, giant radio telescope, and it collects radio waves. Um, then there are other telescopes, like in South Africa, for instance. I visited a uh, um, square kilometer array that is being built. That's a collection of smaller antennas, and they all work together. So you can just kind of orient them together and make a virtual radio telescope out of them. So that's another design. Um, in the Netherlands, I went to a telescope uh, which is really looks like nothing really it's a, it's in a swamp it's in a field like a, a, a nature reserve actually and it's literally it looks like a bunch of solar panels that have fallen flat um you know that's what it looks like like solar panels on the ground or something and it's really completely boring and insignificant uh and when you go there you, you get your feet wet uh because you're literally w walking in a swamp and there are geese flying over you and like oh my god is this a telescope really but this particular telescope works in low frequencies and it detected the slowest pulsar ever, which I also describe in the book. So they're all very different. Um, the way we design radio telescopes, we have many different approaches, uh, but uh, they all, they're all looking for the same objects that we can't see with, with our eyes, but we, we can detect radio waves from. Yeah, you, you you keep mentioning uh, this this flip between neutron stars and pulsars. Are pulsars and neutron stars really the same thing, or can you have neutron stars that aren't pulsars and pulsars that aren't neutron stars? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you can. Yes, uh, so neutron star and the pulsar is the same thing, except uh, basically a pulsar is a neutron star that uh, is giving off this radio radiation that we can detect. There are neutron stars that may not be giving off the radiation, or maybe it is giving off the radiation, but we simply can't detect it. Because when you think about it, it's it's literally like a lighthouse uh, in the sea. If you, you have your lighthouse, you have your light that is turning, right? And only if the ship happens to be in the uh, field of uh, view of the lighthouse that you will, the, you know, the ship will actually see the lighthouse. If not, if it's a little bit out of the way, then the lighthouse will not be visible to the mm. ship ever. So, and the same with neutron uh, with pulsars. Uh, once the the radio, so the radio jets are expelled from the magnetic poles, from the opposite poles, and it spins very rapidly. And if the Earth or our telescope that you're, you know, um, 
trying to detect it with happens to be in the in this field of you know the neutron star that is spinning, then we will register a pulse, but only then. So basically, it's like imagine if you're holding a flashlight and you're like swinging it around, and only when you will like um, kind of come across your your eyes with the with the flashlight that you will see that you know there is there is light coming off from the from the torch from the flashlight, but only then. Because if if not, if it doesn't touch your eyes, then you're not going to know that somebody's swinging a flashlight. It's the same with uh, neutron stars. When I first saw the book, I was thinking, how, how do you write a, a whole book? I mean, and, and it's, it's it's quite a big book and it's small print, 260 pages or so of all of just, and it is just about neutron stars. So so what made you think that you could, that, that it was an interesting enough subject to sort of write so densely about, and because and, it does, it, it, I have to say, like reading through it, it's kept, it's kept me really excited all the way through. But what made you realize that you, you were able to do that? Well, as I started researching it, and I wasn't an expert in neutron, I'm still not an expert, by the way, on neutron stars specifically. I just, I spoke to a lot of experts, amazing people who have been doing all these discoveries. But, you know, at the time, I, yeah, I was just discovering more and more myself as I was reading about them. And uh, what started it, as I said, I was writing about astronomy and neutron stars for quanta and other places. Um, and one of the articles I wrote at the time was about the, um, this, maybe some of the listeners have heard in 2017, we had this amazing merger of two neutron stars detected by um, gravitational detectors, uh, LIGO and Virgo. And uh, so we, yeah, we suddenly spotted that, you know, these two tiny objects collided somewhere far away in space. And the collision, even though they're so small, uh, you know, like if you... If you imagine two cities like, you know, Manchester and I don't know, whatever, Glasgow spinning in space, right? And if, you know, two, like two objects of that size were to collide, uh, normally not, not much probably would happen. But because they're so dense and so massive, so one neutron star, which is only 20 kilometers in diameter, it's heavier than the sun, like a lot, a lot heavier than the sun, much more massive than the sun. And, uh, you know just a teaspoon of neutron star matter like weighs millions of tons. So this this is how heavy it is. So when two of them collided, they sent out, they disrupted uh, space-time fabric and it, they sent out gravitational waves. So these ripples in space-time. And uh, by the time they reached Earth, they were so tiny that, you know, we didn't feel any of that. But really, really sensitive gravitational detectors, they did. And that was the first time that we knew that somewhere far away there was this collision of these two objects, and it produced also an optical, um, what we call in science we say counterpart, but basically it produced light as well. So we could detect light at the same time. So we received gamma rays, uh, sorry, gravitational waves, and we saw light from from this collision as well. And that was for the first time ever. And so I saw that and I thought, okay, this is so amazing. Like, what else do we know or we don't know about these objects? And, you know, there's been so much written on black holes. You know, black holes, I think, is it's also a fascinating subject. But everybody would know, like you say, a black hole and people would know something about a black hole, right? But what people probably don't know is that black hole is not an object, actually. It's just, you know, it's something that happens also at the end of um, life of a very, very massive star. But the object, the real object that is the most, the densest object in the universe before a black hole, which is not an object, but the real object is a neutron star. That I didn't know. And to me, it was fascinating. So it's kind of the last uh, stop before you get to a black hole, the, the densest matter that exists, that's the neutron star. And if it gets a tiny bit bigger, it will collapse into a black hole. And that's what happened with the, the two neutron stars that collided. It formed, they formed a black hole in the end. So, and it's not just that, you know, we don't know what happens inside a neutron star either. So every chapter of the book is organized by location. Uh, I went to all these observatories and I tried to use the location for one specific discovery or a set of discoveries uh, that all kind of follow the same, uh, the, you know, the same idea. Uh, and uh, I describe, like, for example, like one chapter talks about, 
you know, what's inside neutron stars. And we don't know, we have no idea, but we have theories and we have detectors and telescopes trying to probe the inside of neutron stars. So that's that's fascinating. And uh, I think there is enough material for another book or two for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that the, the book starts with you hanging out with astronomers at that time that you mentioned that 2017 merger of the two neutron stars and that 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 was the beginning of what you call multi-messenger astronomy in 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 this and which obviously is a, is a, is a massive moment in astronomy it's it's like well a paradigm shift I, I should imagine so what was it like hanging around with astronomers who were trying to keep a secret and at the same time like clearly excited and yeah, I mean, everybody was was really excited when I was I was at a conference in Jojo Bank in the UK at the time. It was um, a conference uh, to celebrate 50 years of uh, since the detection of uh, pulsars, uh, and. Uh, People were, I just thought they were weird. They were just, you know, suddenly a group of astronomers would just discuss something in really hush hush tones and they didn't have any presentations about it at all. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And I was a journalist, so they wouldn't tell me. And I didn't know what to ask either. Like, I wouldn't ask, like, what are you talking about? You know, and, and, uh, but then uh, one guy, so I was stuck. Uh, I wanted to go back to my Airbnb and uh, the bus just left because I was interviewing someone. So I was like at, at this, at this telescope. And there are no taxis, no nothing, and it's just me. And I'm standing there, and the sun is going, the sun is going down, and I'm like, okay, how am I going to get to my Airbnb? And this guy comes out, and he's like, oh, I can give you a lift. Um, and he turned out to be this amazing astronomer. And we are friends actually now. His name is Matthew Bales. He he's from Australia. He was also visiting the um, the conference. And he then said, okay, you're a journalist. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I can't really tell you a lot about it. And it's really not, maybe not even true or might be true or may not. Like, I don't know, but I'll tell you something and it will be like the biggest point of your career. And I was like, okay, that's really interesting. <laughs> what is he talking about? And he said, but he was very careful because he is a member of um, LIGO collaboration and they were all under embargo. They couldn't disclose what had just happened because everybody was writing these scientific papers about the collision at the same time. So they had to be like, they couldn't leak it to the press. There was already something leaked on Twitter by an astronomer, and that caused, um, like, many people were unhappy about it. Uh, and so they really tried to keep the leaks to the minimum, and he were, he is a member of LIGO as well, like a collaboration, so he couldn't tell me outright what happened. But the way he phrased it, I knew that, and he knew he knew who I was, he knew I was working uh, for, like, for Nature at the time, and Quanta, reputable publications, and I wouldn't leak it. But he could he still couldn't jeopardize his own career. So he couldn't say, hey, this is what happened. But the way he phrased it was, yeah, there might like in case two neutron stars ever collide, this is what's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of how he phrased it. But, you know, I'm not stupid. So I understood he was trying to tell me something. And that's when I wrote that article for Quanta, which, of course, we then timed exactly with the publication of the paper. So we didn't leak anything. We just waited exactly till the moment the paper came out and our story came out. And it was, it was amazing. And how the astronomers, how excited they were and how all of them and there are thousands of them around the world. And they kept the secret uh, because they knew that this was a pivotal moment in multi-messenger astronomy which is effectively basically detecting an object using different means of technology, you know, using optical telescopes, radio telescopes, uh, whatever, like gravitational wave detectors. That's what, what multi-messenger actually means, different messengers that arrive from the same object. Because uh, this, this whole idea of embar uh, press embargoes and, and uh, has come back into the, into the fore again, hasn't it, with this recent Venus episode <laughs> it, I, yeah. I, I noticed a lot of people were whinging about it. what what's your thoughts on 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 things like press embargoes and does that system is that system working i think it's important to wait until a paper is written yes absolutely because uh if there is a detection but it's not a real detection maybe it's just a problem with a telescope, right? And if some if somebody leaks it or starts talking on Twitter about it, it's just going to lead to misinformation and fake science. And I think, I think it's important to keep the embargo. And scientists are very protective of their discoveries, not because they want to be, you know, whatever 
mean or anything like that, but it's simply because they want to check and double check and triple check that the discovery is actually real. And it has to be peer reviewed and confirmed by others. Like in the LIGO case, there were so many teams that were confirming each other's findings and numbers. And I think it's super important because what if, like for instance, there was a candidate uh, neutron star merger in 2019 as well in July, second one. Uh, but it, it's still a candidate's event because it wasn't like we never found an optical counterpart to it. And we still don't know. It's kind of 99% confirmed. But in cases like that, it's very important to just do multiple checks, I believe. So I am on the uh, on the side of people imposing press embargoes for that for that reason. I mean, so, so presumably when you build up that trust with with scientists, that means that you can start working on your story so it's ready for when the embargo is lifted. Absolutely, exactly. So when you have, um, when you establish trust with a few key scientists and they know you're not going to leak their material, they are happy to come to you because it's a win-win situation for them and for you. You as a journalist, you get to write a beautiful story, uh, you get more insights, you get more time to develop it, to craft it. And you make it very different from whatever every other journalist is going to write based on the press material they receive two days before the embargo is lifted. And for them, it's important because they know that they are getting their name in, in, out there, which is really important for them for funding, for recognition, uh, and just to continue their research, really. Um, they can also work with the reporter to explain if something is wrong, if the reporter is not a science journalist, but maybe uh, just a you know, regular journalist covering a science discovery and doesn't have scientific ba background, then they may just get it wrong because the press release may be too technical or whatever, or they may be under time pressure. They may not interpret the facts correctly. So it's a really, it's a win-win situation to have this established relationships with key scientists and and vice versa as well for I, I give media trainings actually to scientists and to journalists and I always say that you know for scientists don't just sit there like once you if you write a paper and you publish it well first don't disappear straight away because journalists will call you and will want to know uh, maybe like get you to explain some jar jargon terms or whatever and to get it right, because they also want to get it right. They don't want to make mistakes. Uh, and do establish those relationships, because then you know that whatever comes out will be an amazing piece of journalism and not something that you yourself as a scientist will say, oh, my God, these stupid reporters, they got it wrong again. I hate media, blah, blah, blah. And that happens all the time. But it happens because the journalists who do want to get it right, but they can't either get to the scientist in time or they don't have these relationships or they don't have the scientific background to understand, you know, the, theory, the, um, the science behind it. When you were writing this book and flying around and, and seeing all these places and meeting all these people, is there a particular chapter, a particular part of that journey of learning about neutron stars and writing about neutron stars that was, was your favorite part, like a, a favorite person or a favorite place or a favorite kind of fact about uh, neutron stars? Well, all the, all the places were amazing and they were all very different. Uh, I would probably single out a few of them. Um, so I would say the first one that was amazing is I went to Italy, I went to Pisa um, because I wanted to visit Virgo, the gravitational wave detector. Now, a lot has been said about LIGO, the American one, and there are two uh, twin detectors in the US, two LIGO detectors. And they're great, absolutely. I would love to visit LIGO one day as well. But I deliberately didn't want to go to LIGO because it was it received a lot of interest already and a lot of coverage from the press. And nobody seems to be going to Virgo, but Virgo was instrumental in this particular merger of these two neutron stars, because if it weren't for Virgo, for the third detector elsewhere, not in the US, then we wouldn't have had the coordinates to pinpoint it exactly as we did, because they all worked together. And Virgo just came online at the time, like literally two weeks or something uh, before the detection, they just finished upgrading Virgo. And they just started where it was the first run and suddenly this happens. It was unbelievable. And all the scientists, the Italian scientists at Virgo and other scientists, it's an international collaboration. They were extremely 
excited, of course, that they also took part in this monumental um, detection. So I wanted to to go to Virgo specifically. And when you go there, like if you're not fascinated by science, you're not going to find it particularly interesting because, frankly, it's in the field, it's outside of Pisa, and it's just too what looks like a semi-cylindrical kind of tunnels or something in the field, two long tunnels that uh, that kind of connected at a right angle. And that's what it is. That's nothing else. So once you go inside, you see like a, a pipe. Um, and if you don't, like you, you could just say, what is this boring tunnel? Like, I don't care, whatever. But if you want to understand what's happening inside and they are happy to show you and, you know, to explain how that really... Um, extremely precise mirrors, and whenever gravitational wave is detected, as it was that that one time, for example, or whenever there is like a black hole merger, we also detect gravitational waves. Those mirrors they shake a tiny, tiny amount. Like you're never going to be able to see it with a naked eye. But what I found fascinating when I was walking around, they even told me that I can't. Like there are places where you can't walk because even your footsteps would disturb the instrument and would send off gravitational waves. So all of this I found completely fascinating. And I spoke to um, to the scientists there, to the director, and just the enthusiasm you can see in those people's eyes, it's, yeah, it's great. And there were people visiting as well. There were a group of students, uh, Italian students who came and some other people. And one guy, I was, I remember standing there and I was looking at the, at the tunnels and I couldn't figure out the, the color. Uh, of the tunnels. And I was like, well, is it blue? Is it gray? Is it purple? What is it? And then he says, he looks at it and, and he tells me, no, it's periwinkle. And I was like, oh, that's an amazing color. I never thought of this color before. And, you know, English is not my first language. My first language is Russian and then French. And, and so I was like, okay, so I had to Google it. And it's actually the color of a flower. And mm -hmm. it's, it described it so precisely. And this guy, it just, it was fantastic that I, you know, I met that person who pointed it out to me and it, it's in the book. So det details like that, I included them in the book too, the, the description of the places. So that was one place. And the other place that probably I would single out is, um, is in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's, there is an amazing telescope which was built uh, quite a few years ago. It's quite old right now and it's called Arecibo. It's it's just a, it's a beautiful beautiful telescope and if anybody watched uh, Golden Eye it features in that movie uh, with James Bond and also Contact with Jodie Foster when she was trying to listen to aliens she was um, actually uh, living in one of the cabins where that astronomers use and I met the astronomer who actually lived in the cabin where they were filming Jodie Foster. And that particular guy, he the whole chapter is actually about him because he's the guy who discovered the first planet around the Pulsar with Arecibo telescope. So this was like one of the highlights of, of, of my journeys because like talking to the guy who found the first planet about a pul like around the Pulsar uh, orbiting a dead star like that, we never knew that you know planets could exist around dead stars before. Uh, and he found it. And that there's a bit of a sad story around it as well that I describe in the book. I don't know if you got that chapter. No, meant, no, but, no, I haven't, no, no, no. Uh, not yet. But um, basically, there was another astronomer who thought that he had discovered the first planet and he published it in Nature. And they were supposed to announce it to the world. They had um, every January, there is a, a big conference in the US about astronomy. And he was supposed to come up on stage and announce the discovery. And journalists already knew because every, everybody received um, the, uh, you know, the description um, of the program of the conference in advance. So everybody knew that there would be an announcement of a planet around the poster, and everybody was super excited. And the astronomer, Andrew Lyne, right before the conference in January, he decided to double check his numbers and he found out that his... Um, you know, going back to our conversation on embargoes, mm. that his numbers were wrong, that the telescope had a, like, that they had a mathematical mistake. Uh, and there wasn't a, pl a planet around that pulsar. And they already published it. So they had to retract their paper from Nature. And there was this big conference coming up where he was supposed to say, hey, I found the planet. And actually, now he was going to say, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't find a planet, guys. I, I made a mistake. And that's a huge embarrassment. 
But this other guy I met in Arecibo, he did find the planet, but he thought that he would be the second one, right? He was also going to announce the discovery, but he thought, like, when he arrived to the to the conference, uh, until about a day before the conference started, he thought he would be the runner-up, and he would just go on stage and say, I, I also found the planet. <laughs> and so now he arrives, and the conference organizer comes up to him and says, hey, Andrew, um, no, not Andrew, Alex, uh, this other guy. Alex, um, you know what? Actually, Andrew made a mistake. He didn't find a planet. So your planet is the discovery. And so it was like for the for the for this guy Alex, it was huge, of course. Andrew was super disappointed, the British astronomer. And it was just very awkward and embarrassing. Uh, but they handled it very well. So Andrew went on stage, he acknowledged he didn't find a mistake, hey, he didn't find a planet, it was all a mistake. The journalists start writing the story. They rush out of the room to like file their stories that there is no planet. And then Alex comes on stage and he's like, actually there is around a different pulsar found with a different telescope and by a different person. I found it, I am the discoverer. And so the journalists kind of rush out again and they write another story. Actually, there is a planet. So it was it was fascinating how it developed. Uh, Andrew Lyne, he's still a bit sad about it, understandably. I spoke to him in, in, in the UK. Um, he still remembers it. Of course, it's a, yeah, it's not great when that happens. But what is great is you're able to acknowledge it. You're able to say to the world, you know what? We made a mistake. It happens. It happens in science. That's what happened. And he was amazing how he handled it. Um, so... Yeah. So this is the second place that I really liked, Arecibo. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, of course, Arecibo's just got a massive gash in it, hasn't it, from a, a broken cable? Yeah, That's a yet big... another one. Yeah, poor Arecibo has just been getting all these problems lately, and uh, they've been trying to repair it from the previous hurricane, and I hope they're going to get funding to repair it again, but it's just it's very unfortunate. But actually, the other thing about Arecibo that's quite interesting, I mentioned Golden Eye. Um, so James Bond, allegedly, at least what I read, I don't know if it's completely 100% true, but apparently Piers Bronston, he's got height anxiety. So when he was filming it, there is a suspension bridge uh, above, the, above the, um, the telescope, which is on the ground. It's a non-movable dish in the ground. And above, really high up, um, can't you remember, like 500 meters or something, that you have to go up uh, via a ladder. And then you have to go up on the suspension bridge to get to the dome, which is right above the actual uh, antenna. And that's the dome that astronomers turn around to detect um, celestial objects. And he couldn't walk on that bridge, you know, because he's got height anxiety. So his double was actually uh, doing it for him. So when I was on that bridge, I thought, Hey, this is so great. I'm doing something James Bond couldn't do. <laughs> so this is kind of the highlight of my trip. It's like amazing. Well, well, maybe you can be the next James Bond. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's <laughs> no, Daniel uh, Craig my is, uh... career. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, well, I mean, the, bu the, the book's fantastic. I mean, it, it takes us through so many different things, like how, how we have gold on the, on, on the planet and stuff like that from all these kill and over events and stuff like that. So... I, I implore everyone to go and read it through. I, I would drag you in to tell us all about it now, but I think we're, we're kind of running out of time. I've got a couple of frivolous questions to ask you, uh, uh, and that is what we always ask all our guests is, um, if you were to bring back a sort of hero from the past to, to show them sort of modern astronomy, or who is there, is there anyone that you would like to bring back as a sort of scientific hero of yours? Yes, absolutely. Actually, the book is uh, dedicated to my two sons and also to Fritz Zwicky, uh, who died not too long ago. Uh, I talk a lot about Zwicky. Uh, he's a very controversial figure. Uh, not many people liked working with him because he was not, a not, not an easy person to get along with, apparently. Uh, he used to get into arguments a lot. He was the guy who would suddenly, you know, start doing push-ups in the middle of a room and very eccentric, very different. But he was just an amazing uh, visionary, probably the wrong word, but he was the one who was able to combine different areas of astronomy and mathematics and physics and kind of have this big vision of what, uh, what would happen if you do 
if you put A and B together. And he's the one who uh, first said that actually supernovas are uh, what, you know, what happens when a star dies. He's the guy who said it in the 1930s. We didn't know what supernovas were, and he's the one who put two and two together. Uh, and nobody believed him at the time, or not many people did anyway. They're like, okay, this is just hand wavy, weird paper. We're going to completely disregard it. And he was right. He turned out to be right. He then went on uh, to completely other subjects, and he cataloged a lot of galaxies, and uh, he also did uh, a lot of uh, monumental stuff on dark matter. So he did a lot of really, really different things. And he would kind of do it. He would have this grand insight, which would turn out to be right. But he, but by the time people realized that he was actually right and stopped ridiculing him, which he didn't care about anyway, <laughs> he would already be doing something else equally big and important. And so I, one thing, one place I really wanted to go to when I was writing the book is his, is his grave. Uh, he's actually buried here in, in Switzerland, I believe somewhere. So this is where I really want to go and I really want to kind of pay my respects. And I would so bring him to our time and, you know, tell him about what we know now about dark matter and show him the amazing facilities, uh, telescopes and other observatories. I think he would be totally fascinated. He probably wouldn't wouldn't show it as much. He probably would say, hey, you know what, I don't I don't <laughs> care about that at all. But I would still love to. Yeah. Yeah. Get him here. Oh yeah, yes. He, he does come across as a really, really fascinating character. I should, I should definitely do a, a, a um, space legend of the week on Zvicky. I think yeah, he's mm-hmm. amazing. But the, is is a, do you see a Zvicky out there at the moment? Like uh, someone that someone perhaps working in astronomy who's not particularly popular, maybe a little bit ridiculed, but is kind of ploughing their uh, own furrow, as it were. Are there people out there doing that now these days? Um, yeah, there are people like that who, well, I mean, one guy who is an amazing, amazing guy, uh, and right now he's very well respected, but to get where he is now, he really had to struggle quite a bit to prove himself and his theories. Uh, his name is Dan Hooper. I also mentioned him in the book. He's a cosmologist, uh, an American cosmologist, and uh, he, he has a very... Um, interesting ideas as well that uh, he was using, uh, but, you know, he was not part of Fermi collaboration. He was kind of an outsider using uh, the facilities. And that's why people didn't, I don't know if you, if you read that chapter on Hooper yet, but, uh, but, you know, there are people like that who kind of publish a lot of papers and the community just doesn't, um, doesn't respect, well, respect is the wrong word, but basically they just don't believe them. I think. And so you have to publish again and again and again to kind of prove that what you're saying is right. So, I, But I'm not going to say any more. That's a fascinating chapter as well. Uh, I would suggest people to actually find out by themselves. It's a non-stop fascinating book. So th- thanks very much for, <laughs> for, 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 for allowing me to have a copy. When, when, is the, when is the book out? Is it already out or when does it come out? It's already out. Uh, it was published on the 15th of September. So it's it's out now. And uh, yeah, I just want to repeat that it's not a hardcore science book. It's a book about people, fascinating people and fascinating facilities that these people have been using over the years to find, you know, to make amazing discoveries. It's mostly about people and science is there as well, but there's no science without people, right? So it's the fascinating bit, isn't it? it what drove someone to find it, and the, and the, and the trials and tribulations they have to do to try and get their point across. I hope that people who are not into science yet will find it interesting and be inspired, uh, inspired to go into science, to study science, to study maths and physics and astronomy, to really unlock secrets of the universe because. There is, of course, applied science, you know, and it's absolutely necessary to build the next MRI scanner or even the next smartphone. Uh, but it's also fascinating to have non-applied science like that because we don't know where we come from exactly. It's all theories. We're trying to understand, unlock all these secrets. And so I think, I hope that this book will inspire a lot of people, boys and girls as well, uh, to go into astronomy because I met so many fascinating women astronomers. Actually, I even list all of them at the end because there are a lot of them, uh, and we don't know them. Nobody knows them because they don't appear that frequently. Women 
tend to be, I guess, more shy when it comes to media appearances, but they shouldn't be. They should be out there as well. And the, the book is also to cele celebrate those women astronomers. So. Yeah, and of course, obviously, neutron stars have got a, an a, spe a, a, a special affiliation with female astronomers, and the and the fact that Jocelyn Bell actually <laughs> is the first person that comments on the on the cover of the book as well is 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 awesome. I I think that neutron stars are great, aren't they? Because they're they're a, they're a cross between because there's elements of quantum physics and cosmology and and general relativity and yeah. and. Of and engineering as well, building these amazing telescopes and 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 yeah, and people just the 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 amount of people that are involved in in this quest and and yeah. such a varied amount of people, it's it's incredible. Yeah. And and the, and the book t does a really marvelous job of, you know, that that entire journey. So yeah, it's it's awesome. Great, great. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for inviting me. The Interplanetary Podcast is. Alive! And there we go, was the interview with Katia Moskvich. Wonderful stuff. I think we should thank the patrons. Yes, definitely. Bob Hodges. John Bernack. Kenton Hockanson. Karel Sim. Julio Abrea. Darren Fuchs. Ronald Hatcher. Marissa Davis. Tupper Hyde. Mark Schoen. Christopher Andreasen, Rob Annabel, Malt Kaislink, Stars Schusa, Patrick Haywood, Orden Fale, Jordan El Kurdi. Welcome, Jordan. Bob Moore. There is no more. Right, that's it. We started with a Bob and ended with a Bob. Fantastic. The Thank Bob's you very much, patrons. Totally you amazing. Are amazing. Totally epic. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Literally amazing. Being a Longan. Space yep. News special. Loved talking about. Um, I um, loved it though. Earth. I love a Space News special. Absolutely, I'm so glad to have been part of one. It's fantastic. We've had some. Oh. Pretty, we've covered some pretty heavy topics over the last couple of weeks, and I've really enjoyed it. But I do love the Space News episodes. What are you doing this weekend, Chris? This weekend is a very chill one in my lovely in our lovely island paradise uh, in Malmoya in Oslo, which is Malmoya is basically stands for like a fossil island. So we basically live on an island which is abundant with fossils. So I think we might do a little bit of a uh, fossil hunting. In fact, the street we live on is called Fossilvian, which is basically fossil way. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna have a little look around the coast and see if we can find some ancient. Uh, remnants. I'm going to go for a quick uh, cream tea uh, for my birthday, a Aww. delayed cream tea for my birthday because we booked a little place to go and have a cream tea. So I'm looking Fantastic. forward to Fantastic. Oh, uh, I'm very jealous of that. Amazing. Very contentious in my house though because the cre because obviously Loretta's Cornish and we're living in Devon and cream teas is a bit of a battle about what goes on cream first or or strawberry jam first. If only, if only the rest of the world only had this to worry about. See that that would be that that would be a problem on a super habitable world. It certainly would. It certainly would. You know, over here in two thousand eight, when they had the financial crash, over here they had a shortage of butter, and they jokingly called it the butter crisis. Uh, so yeah, it had the similar problems in Norway. <laughs> Marlon Brando had a butter crisis. Uh, anyway, we better go because we have. <laughs> yeah, language. definitely. Oh my god. <laughs> Bye bye, Spock Cats! Bye, Spock Cats! Bye, Spock Cats! Bye, 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 bye. bye.